good morning, Hope Church. A huge welcome to those of you who are joining us online and those in the room. We are so glad you're here. And if this is your first time at Hope Church, we are just so glad you are with us today. My name is Zach, and I am the group's pastor here at Hope, and we are in a middle of a series called Crossroads, where we're looking at some of the scenes of the last week of Jesus' time on earth and how many people found themselves at a crossroads. Last week, we looked at a scene where there was a party, and everyone at the party seemed to miss the beauty of the moment. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes I read scripture and I'm like, how did people miss what was right in front of them? But if we're honest with ourselves, we know how easy it is to miss what is beautiful, what is important in front of us all the time. In 2011, um, I was a pastor in San Francisco and I decided it'd be a great great idea to bring a big group of youth with us um, to, the, to Arizona, to the Navajo American Indian Reservation to do some home repair. And so I got as many youth as I could legally fit in a 15-passenger van, and we started our trek south, southeast to Arizona. And what really helped me survive the Katy Perry and the smell of Axe deodorant that just wafted in the air <laughs> was just the fact that we were first going to go to the Grand Canyon. And I was so excited because I was taking a bunch of youth who were from the city who had spent very little time outside, and I was so excited to create memories. And so we drove 12 hours to Williams right outside the Grand Canyon. The next day we woke up early, and we got there, and we were just taking it in. Whomever's been there knows it is gorgeous. Well, it was probably just a little over a minute of taking it in when the first youth came to me and said, Pastor Zach, can we go back in the van? And I said, no, we're, we're at the Grand Canyon. We are spending some time here. Well, when can we go back in the van? I want to get back on my phone. I need to text my friends. They're wondering what's going on. And I was just sitting there thinking, gosh, we have the Grand Canyon right in front of us. But, we, but that youth couldn't focus on the beauty that was in front of them. And whatever they had was contagious because before I knew it, all the youth within five minutes wanted to go back into the van to be on their devices and to be distracted by something so much lesser than the Grand Canyon. Now, we know in our society that distraction is not just a youth problem. It's something we all encounter every single day. I mean, we live in the most distracted time in world history. I mean, I know many of us, we've brought devices that are good but distract us every single day, right? Our phones, they do a lot of great things, but the average person is, spend, or is touching their phone 2,600 times a day. A lot of good things that happen on phone, but we're also a lot of things that are taking us away from what's most important. And again, this isn't just a young thing. I mean, baby boomers, the boomers in here right now and watching online, on average, every baby boomer, not every baby boomer, but average amount of time baby boomers spend on their phone is 5.4 hours of screen time a day. TVs, the average home has their TV on for 35 hours a week. It's like our TVs could have a full-time job. And I'm not up here giving an anti-technology message. I love technology, but what breaks my heart is that many times when we're distracted, it's in front of the people that matter the most to us. And the thing about distraction is we are sometimes distracted by things that are really good, but just have a misaligned priority in our life. Like I know work, for example, work is a good thing, but we're seeing more and more people who are addicted to work. And I mean, there's some people who are addicted to not working, and that's for a different message. But work, <laughs> work is captivating our hearts that we bring our work home with us. It continues to be on our heart, and we can't be present even when we are not working. Yet never on someone's deathbed have someone ever told me that, Zach, I just really wish I would have taken a few more overtime shifts. I really wish I would have worked more. If only I missed more of my kids' games to get done what needed to be done, um, that would have been a win. But rather, regret usually de you know, deals with missed opportunities. You know, not being present, being distracted from the most important relationships in their life in real time. 
And this is for people wherever you are in your spiritual journey. I know you experience distraction. You know, so, I mean, you can be a Christian here and say, I follow Jesus, my allegiance is to him. He is my Lord and Savior. But the moment things don't go our way, when we get news we don't want to hear, when someone treats us a way that we don't want to be treated, it is so easy to take our eyes off Jesus and start gazing at something so much lesser that just takes our time and our emotions and our heart. And Jesus is way more beautiful than the Grand Canyon, but it's so easy to be distracted. Now, what encourages me is that distraction, while, you know, we're at a more distracted time than ever, distraction is actually an ancient problem. And it's one that Jesus has a lot to say about. And I think if we got this right, how to be present, to not have distraction, just captivate our hearts all the time and make us miss what's most important, it would speak deeply to the world around us. And so today we are going to be looking at a story where Jesus teaches his distracted disciples a super important lesson, both through the way that he lives and through his words on how to be present to what's important. So we find ourselves in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, where um, Jesus is with his disciples. He's with his disciples. And his disciples are people that he's done life with for three years. We'll go to this one in a little bit. So we'll just go to the scripture but he's with his disciples who he's been with for three years. And pretty much he spent over 8,000 hours with them doing life. They haven't just heard a few sermons, but instead they've been doing life with him and they, for some reason, for whatever reason, they are not able to understand what Jesus is trying to teach them because most recently he's been telling them that he is about to die, but they do not get it time and time again. And this time, Jesus goes a step further, and he tells them that, you know what, not only are you going to deny me, but you guys are going to, I mean, not only am I going to die, but you are also going to deny me. And so this is what happens. So Jesus tells them that, but then Peter responds to him and says, even if all fall away, so even if those guys fall away, I will not. So he's distracted from what Jesus is telling him. And he says, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. So Jesus corrects him. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. I mean, this, this scene is wild where Jesus, yeah, you guys are going to disown me. And Peter pretty much says, no, Jesus, you are wrong. He's distracted, right? And then so Jesus gently corrects him, and then he comes back still distracted and says, no, no, fine, if you have to go that way, okay, but I am going to die with you. And then all the other disciples don't want to be up by Peter, so they're like, oh, no, no, we are all in it to win it. We are all going to die with you. They are completely missing it because they are distracted by their reputation, by their pride. And so going back to that fill-in-the-blank that was up before, this is the problem with distraction. So distraction is destructive because it misplaces our priorities and our allegiances, which take us down roads we were never meant to take. And it's usually these roads of least resistance. It's like when we are distracted, we don't even know where we're going to be going because we don't even understand our surroundings. I used to bike a lot in San Francisco, and I'd go over the Golden Gate Bridge, and I always told Megan, You're gonna, this is how I'm going to die. There's going to be some tourist who is on the bridge who's going to whip out their selfie stick at the last second and not see me and knock me over the bridge because people were so distracted on there all the time. They didn't know what was happening. There were so many injuries. I mean, it's wild how when you're distracted, you don't understand what's around you, and you go down these roads of little resistance. But what I love about Jesus is that while his disciples are distracted, his, these people that he loves deeply, he is not going to be distracted from where he needs to go. And so going on in the scriptures, they went to a place called Gethsemane. So this is a garden right outside of Jerusalem. It's a place they would go often. It's a place they'd go to pray. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So he took Peter, James, and John, and out of the 12 disciples, these are like his three in the inner circle. And Peter, the guy we're looking at a lot today, he was one who Jesus said, you are the rock I'm going to build my church upon. He actually changed his name to Peter from Simon, which means rock. 
And so he brings this three from the inner circle along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. And so they see Jesus here, and he is, you know, he's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And the reason is because he's about to die, and not just die, but he's taking the sins of the world upon himself. And just the thought of what he is about to go through almost kills him. Now, what is sin? We think about, we, many of us have heard the word sin. We, it literally means missing the mark. You know, we think about coloring outside the lines or something like that. But what is the mark that we are actually missing? And if you look in the Bible, it, sin is deep. It, focus de- it focuses deeply on relationship. You know, Ignatius of Loyola said, sin is unwillingness to trust what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. It's being distracted from the plans that God has for us and instead thinking that we know what's best for us. You know, we see this with the original sin in the Garden of Eden where God creates this beautiful garden and says, Adam, Eve, you guys can have fruit from any tree in the garden except one. And instead of being focused on that relationship, trusting that God has what's best for Adam and Eve, they get to this point where they're distracted and they start thinking, what is God holding from me? Why is he keeping me away from being happy and being who I am meant to be? You see, sin, it's that not trusting of God and it distracts us from all other things in life. Eugene Peterson, late pastor in America, he said this about sin. He said, sin is a refused relationship with God that spills out into wrong relationships with others. It's one we're not trusting that what God has for us is best and we want to take things in our own hands instead of being co-laborers with God is when everything falls apart. Our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And it affects us to our core. So in other words, sin breaks God's heart. And now what we're about to see with Jesus is about how sin is about to break his body. And so going on a little further, he, Jesus, fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, that this hour might pass from him. Abba, Father. So he's praying, and Abba is um, Aramaic for Father. Jesus is the only one around this time period who who talks to God as Father, just this deep relationship. And that's how he invites all of us to pray. He says, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. See, Jesus, the key for Jesus to not being distracted is to have his eyes focused on God. He brings all that he is to God and just opens up his heart to him. This is not just like a prayer of resignation. No, this is one of complete participation where he is trusting all of his emotions. I don't want to go through with this, but I trust what you're doing. Your will be done because he knows that what God wants to do is to restore that relationship that was broken at Eden. And so in this garden scene, we see these two truths that are central to the gospel. And the first one is, our sin is great. I mean, just the thought of it is breaking Jesus' body. He doesn't even want to think about it. And the second one is that God's love is greater. And you can only hold those together when you have, or you have to hold those together to understand the big picture truth of that. Because it's only when we understand the depth of our sin can we understand the depth of God's love and what he had to go through and what it truly cost him. And that's why if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to take sin seriously because it's constantly breaking our connection with God, and it's what God came to die to break the power of. So after this, he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. They were distracted. They missed the whole scene. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? So he calls him by his old name. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? This is so key. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is 
week. And so we see that truth that God's love is deeper than sin here. But sin is making our flesh weak. It is corrupting it. And that's why we need a practice. We need a way so we do not fall into temptation. But as you go and read the rest of this story on your own time, you see with Peter what happens. He doesn't take Jesus' call to watch and pray seriously. Instead, he falls asleep two more times. And then the last time when Jesus wakes up, Peter doesn't even know what to say. He is going down a road that he was never meant to walk. And then after that, Jesus, you know, is betrayed. He's handed over to the authorities. And Peter says, you know what? I'll take things into my own hands. And he cuts off a guy's ear when Jesus has to reprimand him and heal the guy that he hurts because he is starting to fight battles that God is not even calling him to fight. He is going down a road that might look like it's one of faith on the outside, but it's just one that's corrupted. And then he goes further on that night. He ends up, as Jesus said, denying him three times. And it was only then did he understand how far down a road that he was never meant to go, that he was down to the place that he was broken. But what Jesus is saying here is so important for all of us. We can go back to the last slide, that we need a practice to not fall into temptation because if Peter, the rock in which God is building his church on, is weak, of course, we are going to make a lot of mistakes as well because sin is at our core. But that's why Jesus leaves us with that watch and pray so we will not fall into temptation. The author of Hebrews says it this way. He says, let us throw off, I love it, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, right? It's like we have a place to go. We need to go forward. So we need a practice where we are throwing away the things that are hindering us from going down the roads that we are meant to go down. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It was only for the joy of being back with each of us that he was able to have the strength to endure the cross. It had him go forward and not be distracted to what he was thinking about and scorning at shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the, the discipline that early Christians used to throw off the stuff that's entangling us was one called daily repentance. Daily repentance. And what it was was taking a time every single day to evaluate your life because they knew how the flesh was weak and would bring us down roads we were never meant to go, so we were to check our life. It was never meant to make us perfect or anything like that, but it was to make us more connected and to make sure we are living the life that God calls us to. A verse that really speaks about this discipline comes from Psalm 139, and I just love this. And it's just an invitation from the psalmist to invite God to evaluate who he was and to bring him to the right road. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So with repentance, I know that's another big word we hear a lot. It's leaving what brings death and going towards what brings life. And that starts with confession. See, in a psalm like this, it's like you, he, the psalmist is inviting God to do the searching. And when God searches us and we find out the ways in which we are living that is not in accordance with what God is calling us to, we are then in char- charge to name it and turn away from it. Now, early Christians had four categories to evaluate confession and repentance. These are just categories they created in order for them to evaluate their life and um, see the sin that was sitting in them. And the first one is blatant sin. Now, blatant sin, they're just the sins that secular culture and kingdom culture agree upon. I mean, this could be reprimanding your child in public for your own gain. We can all agree that that is very wrong. So those are the ones that are usually on the surface. And then the next one are deliberate sins. And these are ones that, you know, um, secular culture and kingdom culture, they disagree about. about. For the early Christians, it could be something like sacrificing or eating meat sacrificed to idols. 
you know, secular culture said that's totally fine, but Christians knew that they weren't supposed to do that. I mean, today that could be for us evaluating our screen time. What is a healthy way? Are we being distracted or not? Well, others in societies might say, I mean, that's important, but it's not necessarily something wrong. Unconscious sins are the ones that are a bit deeper, and these are patterns of thought that are kind of ruling our life. And again, these are deeper. So as God invites you into this, it could be something where you just realize, man, I care a lot more about being right than I do about being in relationship with people. Man, as an owner of this business, I care a lot more about being productive than I do the people that are entrusted to me. And then there are these inner orientations of the heart, and some psychologists talk about this as your false self, where you understand how you are operating, and you start to see, is it in line with how God has created me? You know, it could be something like you're not seeing your identity as a child of God, but it's in how people are viewing you or in how much money you make. Or it's, man, I am living my life as if I trust money instead of trusting God that he has what is best for me. And so these are just some categories that the early Christians would use to understand their sin. And as it would come up in those times, as they would reflect on their day, what they would then do is create a game plan and how to turn away from it. And it could be like if you, are, you realize, man, I am treating my neighbor not the best, then you go and you figure out ways to repair that relationship as well. And now the beautiful thing about daily repentance, and there's so many of those, so many beautiful things if you choose to engage it, is how as you start to do it, you start to do it more. You know, I think some of us, it's easy to think, man, like after I start repenting, I get to this place where I have less to repent about. But if you engage in it, what you realize is, man, my flesh is weak. I see these desires. They are a mess, but I don't want to be a slave to them anymore. You see, I kind of see daily repentance. I'm sure some of you guys are like, oh, great, a preacher's up here talking about repentance. But I see it as like such a great invitation to a road of life. And I know how easy it is for me to be deceived. And so engaging in this, I'm like, gosh, I want to throw away everything that is hindering me from my connection with God. And I only want to go down the roads that he has called me to, and I know it is so easy to get off the right road, and this brings me right back if I choose to say yes to it. I love what Tyler Stanton, he's a pastor in Portland, says. He says, the pathway of spiritual maturity, it's a descent, not an ascent. It's going deep. And a maturing community is a confessing community, not a church without sin, but a church without secrets. You see, for us as a church, You know, we only mature at the speed of our repentance because we're not letting any false self stuff, any sin hold us from what God is calling us to be. And not only that, we we understand at a deeper level how easy it is for sin to entangle us. We don't want anything to do with it. And we start just to have our empathy and love grow for people when we enter into this because we don't start viewing people by their sin and we, can have, we have no place to judge because we realize how messed up we are at a deeper level. And instead, we want people to walk in true freedom. We understand, as the scriptures say, that we were all slaves to sin and we want everyone to taste sweet freedom. Now, It would be foolish for me just to be up here and talk about that without leading us through how does this practice really work. And so I'm going to be leading us through a time of repentance. Don't worry, you don't have to talk to the person next to you about this. You're going to be talking to God, though we should be more nervous about talking to God than the person next to us in all reality. But I want to encourage, especially anyone here who, you know, maybe they know that for a while that they have been on the wrong road, that they have been resisting trusting God within part of their life, that today is a day to turn away from what is bringing death and go to what brings life, to go to a road that was created for you before the creation of the world. Now, one of the reasons I care deeply about deeply or about daily repentance is because I have seen time and time again the transformative way the ways that it has transformed my life when I open up my heart, my wounds to God. You know, about ten years ago, and I mean I could go off about a lot of my sins, but 
you guys can come find me afterwards in the hub if you want to talk about that. But, uh, you know, one thing I was really working on about 10, 15 years ago was just anger. I found that I had a lot of anger, but people didn't really know it. You know, I mean, people would say, wow, Zach has an edge. He, he knows how um, to tell people how the apple is cut, but I was able just to hide while well, bitterness, frustration was in me. And I kind of even started to think, oh, that's just part of who I am. That's cool. But when I was really confronted with God by it, I realized, no, 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 that anger shouldn't have such a hold of me. What's really happening in my life is that I have little patience, that I have very little self-control, and I have a huge love deficit that only Jesus can fill. And so I started going, and you know, some of these things, it's not like it's all easy. I'm not up here saying this process is easy. You know, some of those sins are a little bit stickier, and it's a little bit harder to turn away from. And I had been living my whole life like that, so it was one that was hard to turn away from. But what ended up first started happening in my mind is as I started to name it, that anger, when those things would come up in me, I started just to have such a strong distaste for it. I didn't want to indulge it that much anymore. And then I started to see more steps and steps of freedom as I continued to turn away from that every single day and would evaluate my interactions with people and start really naming what was right and what was wrong. Well, a few months into this, you know, about 10 years ago, um, we had a good family friend come and visit us in San Francisco. We had a great time eating at some fun restaurants in San Francisco. And, um, you know, after that, I didn't think that much of it. But a few weeks later, my sister called me. And she said, yeah, I heard you had a great time out in San Francisco. And I was like, yeah, it was wonderful. And, you know, and she said, you know what I heard? Our friend said that you changed. I was like, what? What do you mean I changed? She said that you were just a lot more peaceful, that you were a lot more calm. And she's kind of wondering what you're really doing in San Francisco. <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny because they had no idea what I'm praying through, right? <laughs> what I'm working through, what I have come to hate. But it was cool how what God was doing on the inside of me was starting to flow to the outside. And I'm so glad I said yes to that 10, 15 years ago because I'm in a much farther place now. And I still make mistakes. I still give into it. But again, it has such a distaste for me when it comes up that I want to throw off everything hindering me from that. And because I chose to say yes to that 10 years ago, you know, it has blessed me. I've been a much more of a blessing to so many people. I've been a much better dad, a much better husband, a much better friend, a much better person, and that much more connected with God. But it only starts when we say yes. Again, Peter you know, he went far down that road, but it was only when he understood the depth of his sin was he then ready to get back on the right road. And the beautiful thing is that road, that path was still available for Peter, but it was only available for Peter when he said, you know what, I'm going to turn, I'm going to repent, and I'm going to go on the right road. And if you look at Peter through the book of Acts, through the letters that he wrote, he is a completely changed person. But it started with that yes, and what is available to Peter is available to each and every one of us. If we just say, yes, I trust you, Jesus. I trust the path that you have for me. I am going to go on your road, and I am not going to let anything distract me. And when I find that I'm on the wrong road, I am going to jump right back on because it is the way to life. And so we're just going to do this practice together, and this is one you can do in your homes. I encourage you to do it every day. I think night's a great time because you can think about what has happened over your life or over your day when you do that. And it's just really simple. It's just posturing yourself in a place. And what I would do, I mean, studies show that if you choose a time and place, you are much more likely to do it. I mean, if you just say, I'm going to do it, there's most likely you're not going to do it. So it's so important to carve out a time and a space just to do this, just to invite God into your day and have him search your heart and see what he brings up. And when he brings things up, I encourage you to name it and go towards the way of life. And so what I'm going to invite all of us to do is just stand. We'll all stand up together. And, 
And what we're going to do is just, just get into posture to receive. I like to have my hands open just because it just makes me not distracted from anything else, and then I don't have anything else in my hands to distract me as well. And we'll just, I'll just pray Psalm 139 over us. Just give us some time to think. And whatever God brings to our heart, I just encourage you to take home with you and confess it to him and go to the way of everlasting. So let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you so much that you are the one that doesn't get distracted. That you thought of each and every one of us as you were going to the cross. And it was that joy of us being back in right relationship with you that gave you the power to go forward. And God, I just pray for us right now that we don't become friends with our sin, that we just don't justify it, say it's part of who I am, but we just throw off everything that entangles us. And so, God, we're just coming to you giving everything to you. And so we just invite you, God, to search us. Know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in us. And lead us to ways everlasting. Jesus, may you just give us the strength to trust you with our life. You don't just have good things for us in the next life. You have good things for us now. And it's only if we go on the road that you are calling us to. So strengthen our heart. Help us say no to distraction and go on the path of everlasting life that you have for us, Jesus. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your love. We just pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. My name's James, and I'm on staff here at Hope Church. If you found that content helpful, please let us know by hitting the like button. Drop some comments down below. We'd love to chat and engage with you further. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. That way you get a notification every time we go live and when we post new content. We do live stream our Sunday morning services starting at 925 Central. We'd love to have you come and be a part of our growing online community.